So without further ado, could everybody give a big round of applause for Mr. Gene Youngblood. <laughs> I first want to say it's an honor for me to be with you. Uh, I mean that sincerely. Um, the leading edge or crest, if you will, of a wave, the art and technology wave. I've been writing all my adult life, professionally, quote, as a theorist since 1968. So I, I'm truly uh, delighted to be here and hear your ideas. I have some ideas that I hope are relevant to your ideas. This is about taking things seriously. To take something seriously is to make it your way of being in the world, period. Let's say that again. To take something seriously is to make it your way of being in the world, nothing less. I know that a lot of us do take certain things seriously, I'm going to mention here, and, it's, and we don't make it our way of being in the world because we don't know how. Things are that way these days, aren't they? Well, so I'm going to try to give you, uh, share with you some ideas I've been working on all my life about how to do that. Given this really breathtaking moment, what I think of where we stand now is kind of a hinge of history, hmm? uh, very breathtaking hinge of history that may, in fact, literally take our breath away. I don't think there's anyone in this room who has not, is not familiar with that thought, that idea. So we'll be addressing that. I didn't realize, actually, that this is sort of going to be Bucky Day, uh, but since it is, that's, that's terrific. Um, and since Gray Area invokes Bucky's idea of world game in the, in the literature, I, I thought I'd start with that. We're going to go into these two words extensively later, but I just want to say that Buckminster Fuller was a utopian radical. To me, those two words summarize what he was for me. All of those other things, design scientists, all great, no, no problem. But his legacy for me, what the fire that burned in my life ever since, is be, wanting to be a utopian radical. <clears throat> um, we're very familiar with this. It's, you know, people, you see that in people's signatures and their emails and so on, and that's, you know, I like that. <laughs> uh, I would like to suggest, and I think it's obvious, probably everybody in this room thinks they are or would like to be proposing that model. And I want to point out that uh, the the archetypal utopian vocation is precisely the builder of models. So in that sense, you're all utopians. And it's uh, more serious than that, actually. We'll get into that. <clears throat> the title of the talk, The Build, Creating on the Same Scale as We Can Destroy. That's what world game has always meant to me. Another way of putting it is to imagine at scale. I think a lot of the presentations I've seen here today, unfortunately couldn't be here yesterday, are begging that question. How do we imagine at scale? Some of you, many of you, do imagine at scale in the work that you do. The things I've heard here today are exactly that. And imagining at scale is the absolutely first essential step if we're gonna create on the same scale as we can destroy. And I think that phrase that I just said, which by the way is not mine, and we'll get into that later, uh, is also the question that is begged by all of our work. And it's the, it's the desire that we have. And we know that we'd better do it or things are gonna get seriously tough. And can we do it? Back in the early days, 1970, began working closely with Bucky and the world game people. I want to emphasize that from the very instant I saw what I was going to do in the world, which was keep 
building or proposing or theorizing models of communication that would enable this thing. What, you know, I don't care if you call it world game, you know, that was a positive sum game, and we, we, all, we all know about that. Again, I just want to say, whether it's ever called world game, it simply doesn't matter to me. We know that's what we have to do. This is why Bucky's so, he, he, you know, his popularity is really exciting to me. because I can't think of one person from that era as visionary and prescient as, as this man was, one person who you want to keep repeating these amazing quotes and visions. So anyway, uh, it fired me up from the beginning. And uh, from the beginning, this is what I thought would lead to the ability to, quote, play world game, that is to say, imagine at scale, this was what was going to be necessary. This is me uh, calling for a national information utility in 1974. What we need to do in this country, and in fact in all advanced industrial nations, is to have what you might call a national information utility. This would be a utility like any other gas, water, electricity, and so on. The main difference being that <clears throat> the services or goods or vital necessity that this utility would provide to the public would be access to information specified by the user and access to communications channels controlled by the user. The technical part has to do with considering these technologies as components of a national information utility. They are cable communication networks, or what most people know as cable TV, portable video recording equipment, or what most people now know as portapack, program retrieval systems, that is, video cassette and video disc players, remote access computer utilities, or time-shared computers, domestic communication satellites, planet analysis or resource satellites, and finally, what you might call new information display systems for the home. Taken as components of a single integrated whole system, they have the potential of completely inverting the organizing principle now embodied in the structure and function of the mass media. That is the principle of centralized, one-way, mass audience, non-adaptive, perceptual imperialist message distribution, as it is manifest in the structure and function of television, radio, newspapers, and the cinema. The national information utility embodies a, an organizing principle which is exactly the inverse of the industrial organizing principle. Rather than centralized one-way mass audience non-adaptive perceptual imperialist message distribution, this principle is one of decentralized two-way special audience user-controlled perceptually adaptive feedback communication system. It is in effect a cybernetic system which can allow conscious control of our socio-cultural evolution. Because of the profound implications and, and impact of these tools on the present system, their continued development in a, in a sort of a laissez-faire entrepreneurial manner uh, may have very serious consequences and therefore the national information utility must be supported by public funds and operated as a common carrier public utility. Whereas now the user of the mass media is considered the passive receiver of industry's output and therefore the mass media cultivates demand for output, which gives them authority to cultivate more demand, and the user is seen as a passive receiver, and an inversion of that would be where the user of, of a decentralized two-way special audience user control uh, system, the user would be seen as one subset of the set of all possible classes of input. Our perception of what is possible is shaped by our perception of, the, of alternative models. By inverting the industrial organizing principle, by surrounding ourselves with, with the kind of value systems to which we subscribe, for the first time then, aesthetics and politics coming very closely together through user-controlled information environments, user-controlled aesthetic models of alternative ways of making the world work and alternative material and cultural realities, and then conducting dialogues and arriving at consensus on these various alternative propositions, it seems to me that one of the most profound aesthetic and political possibilities that any nation has ever had before us.
power of the people. You, you may, uh, some of you may be familiar with this book by Tim Wu. Uh, 36 years after my talk, this is in 2010, and I mean, I mean no disrespect at all to this man, he's great, in which he calls it the separation principle. That's what, you know, what I was saying, but, but not in those words. In other words, vertical integration of those industries rather than horizontal. Uh, otherwise, you don't have a democratic system if you don't do that. And I just want to say, I was not alone, you know, and uh, later we'll see some more evidence of I was not alone. He shows in this book, historically, what he calls the, the information industry. And again, I, look, it isn't about access to information. It's about access to people, access to community. If you go, if you think access to information, that's what you're going to get, information. If you think access to community, you're going to get both the community and the information they generate. Like, this is obvious. Never, ever, ever say the information revolution, you know, the information highway. That is not what it's about. Um, I would even say, you know, using that term is to buy into our own oppression. You know, it just, it just, we're not there. We're not part of that agency. It's just information. And so anyway, Tim Wu says, will the internet follow the same fate as, these, as all these other industries, you know, where he said, uh, invention begets industry and industry begets empire. Think about uh, the, the talks we've heard today and yesterday, uh, which basically say that, or at least, you know, allude to it or beg that question. <clears throat> Invention begets industry and industry begets empire. Will the internet follow the same fate? Will it come to be ruled by a corporate leviathan in possession of the master switch? Uh, a battle royal for the internet's future is brewing and this is one war we dare not tune out. I'm quoting from him. Well, I'm just saying with no disrespect whatsoever, we've known that for a long, long time. It should not come as news to anyone in this room. Do you take it seriously? Remember I was that to take something seriously is to make it your way of being in the world. I think you would love to make it your way of being in the world. And I think that many of the projects uh, and models, the same models have been presenting here are exactly that. Your, your attempt to make that what you take so seriously being your way of being in the world, and you know it, and you're doing it. And that's why I'm honored to be with you. Here's, uh, okay, so that lecture you saw uh, was 1974. Four years earlier, 1970, uh, here's uh, another, here's my call to arms. The media must be liberated, must be removed from private ownership and commercial sponsorship, must be placed in the service of all humanity. We must make the media believable. We must assume conscious control over the video sphere. We must wrench the intermedia network free from the archaic and corrupt intelligence that now dominates it. Now this amazing uh, and startling statement was made by Gene Youngblood in a journal called Radical Software in the summer of 1970. Uh, we could look at this and listen to this today as if it were just written. I just want to point out that I was saying that I wasn't alone. I mean, that after all, that was published in a journal dedicated to the subject, right? So it's like, it was the zeitgeist, you know, it was ambient. Now, that's what a lot of people who we, we admire or, 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 or move us, they articulate what we, we already know. You know we know that. That's what Bucky did for a lot of us. And uh, so, yeah, I was able to do that. And people say, well, well Gene did that. But I, you know. it's really important for young people today, people today working at this, to know that there's a history. Not, not because it you know, shows you, you don't know anything, but it, it shows you're on the right path. You know, history is on your side. And you need to know these things. And, you know, uh, this you see here was the beginning of media activism. The whole uh, you know, media democracy movement started in that, in that zeitgeist, right along with Bucky Fuller. 
about his ideas. And I never stopped. I'm still building, theoretically, the better model. I don't consider myself a theorist anymore. I consider myself a utopian radical. We'll get more into that. Uh, and my idea of that model keeps getting more sophisticated and rolling with the times and with the reality of these days. And that's what this talk is about. Okay, gray area leads you to this article I wrote called uh, Secession from the Broadcast. First um, paragraph, this is four years ago, by the way. This is, this is an essay, which is a transcription of a lecture I did four years ago. Summon the breathtaking image of the multitude pouring into streets and plazas around the world in millions to demonstrate against tyranny. Now imagine instead they're demanding a free and open internet. The likelihood of that is almost zero, we would agree. That's interesting. Uh, but why is that? What would have to happen to make that utopian spectacle reality? What insurgent algorithm would get us from here to there? What I'm going to do uh, right now is refer to this sort of the ur text. <laughs> it's, I'm proud of it. It's, it's one of the best things I've written on the subject, but it's four years ago, and I keep thinking, and the world keeps evolving. So I'm going to uh, periodically quote the text and then uh, comment on it four years later today's reality, and then uh, uh, throw in a few uh, little snippets of text, uh, uses of language that, I, that I'm doing now. Okay. Okay, the first thing is that I wouldn't say it that way anymore, the way that, the way that is. Today I would say, imagine we were demanding a worldwide, socialized, toll-free, public internet as a global nervous system for planetary survival. That other one was like low chance that there's a zero possibility of what I just said, and that, that word worldwide is the key there. That simply is not going to happen, and that's not good news, but we know it never will. No possibility of that, and the odds are near zero even of some of the toll-free, socialized, public utility internet happening in even one, one country such as ours. And I'm, I propose that if we don't do that, our chances of creating at the same scales we can destroy are very thin. I would love for someone to prove me wrong on that one. I mean, think about it. The, the internet, by, which by the way, I'm using here, but what I really want to say is the digital condition. What we're all talking about is the digital condition at which you might say the internet is at the center, but it's, you know, to say that is limiting the internet. It's the digital condition. All the stuff we see going on here isn't necessarily the internet, but it is the digital condition, what, what that enables. And, you know, notice, even if you, even if they're not talking about, you know, how the internet should be regulated, the internet isn't even mentioned. In, in current discourses about in, oh, excuse me, infrastructure. Oh, oh, it's potholes and we need new bridges. The very thing, the internet, which could enable, which could accelerate and enable all of this, isn't even, it doesn't exist in public discourse. And certainly not by any people trying to be president, right? Let me uh, point something out here. This, this language, eco-social nervous system, okay? Back 52 years ago, Marshall McLuhan influenced us all at that time, and how can you not? Uh, understanding media, the extensions of man, no women, just men. And, uh, you know, that was the idea uh, certain technologies are extension of the body, our, our physical capabilities. Others, which he was interested in, was, was extensions of the mind, of the nervous system, right? For a while, you know, people my generation, and me too, I, I kind of like, put that down, it's like I forgot about it. I, oh yeah, you know, the world nervous system. That's a, isn't that a little, uh, I don't know, kind of new agey or something? Uh, but lo and behold, we come back full circle almost to where, in my mind, this is the central way. This is the way to look at this situation. So I think I've covered most of these here. Symmetrical emotional bandwidth, I'm gonna get to later. Into an encryption, I assume all of you know what that is. And so the two things we're gonna to get to later is symmetrical emotional bandwidth 
and translocal social heterotopias. This is not techno babble, I assure you, and you will, <laughs> you will, uh, I hope you will agree when we get to that. All right. <clears throat> I take that very seriously. And so it really brings up the question how do we think things? We think things through language, right? You know, uh, thought is made in the mouth. And so I want to start with some language. That, um, that essay, Secession from the Broadcast, I want to talk about the broadcast. Today we have the digital condition, and we have the internet. The broadcast, whatever you, that may mean, is I think not something you would immediately associate with the internet. It's, the broadcast is what's going away, gradually uh, centralized mass communication. I think now is the time to kind of um, elaborate on this word, expand this word, uh, because now we have something that the broadcast is not, which allows us to see what the broadcast is or what that phrase could mean in a very politically potent manner, I think. I'm gonna get to uh, momentarily the next slide. Um, the, the, uh, you know, the sort of the base of what everyone would think of broadcast, oh, you mean media, that's the media. Yeah, we're talking about the media, yeah. And we'll do that, we'll talk about that. But I think of this term as having many levels. So there you are with the media. Then the next step you will see is uh, the structure, you know, the structures behind it. And the next step is sort of larger and larger. And as I go through and, uh, and, and go through those steps, you'll see what I mean. But basically it ends up with civilization. <laughs> I think of the broadcast as civilization itself. And then what does that mean? It means us. The civilization isn't here, we carry it. And that has really important consequence. Okay, let's start at that basic level, the medium. And this is from the text. Uh, the broadcast is all state media, their institutional infrastructure, their political economy, the culture they create, and the social control the culture serves through the socialization it administers. The broadcast is all state media. You would say corporate media but let's be consistent, this is from the text still. We live in a corporate state and corporate media are state media. That's been understood at least since the early 20th century. In a democracy, government must rely on corporate media instead of state ministries to disseminate state propaganda. It's like, what else? Corporate media are state media just as the private banking cartel known as the Federal Reserve is a state bank. Their state media, just as ExxonMobil, is a state oil company. And we know that privatized state media are more effective than nationalized media precisely because they're not seen as state media. So folks, never say corporate media. Always say state media when you're talking about that component of the broadcast. The co-partnership of American media and the state is a triumph of what Sheldon Wolin calls inverted totalitarianism in his incredible book, Democracy Incorporated. Everyone should read that 10 times. We're the showcase of how, of how democracy can be managed without appearing to be suppressed. The American people are victims of the most successful psychological operation ever inflicted on a national population the most sophisticated propaganda campaign any regime has ever deployed against its own citizens. So never say the media aren't doing their job. They are doing their job. We aren't doing ours. And their job is to make sure of that. Their job is to manufacture non-citizens. Now I'm gonna make, so that's the text, right? Four years ago, now I'm gonna make a little comment on that. When we say we live in a corporate state, we're not talking about corporations. We're talking about the state. The problem is not corporations. 
not ever. The problem is always, in every case, the state whose laws sanction corporate tyranny and plunder. It's all legal unless it's not. And even then, they get away with it. Understand what it's saying here. Laws, this is the law. We're talking about the state. You don't go after the, the corporations. You go after the state. So, continuing on with that text, the social control the broadcast serves is based on controlling the social construction of realities. More accurately, the broadcast controls the contexts in which realities are socially constructed and culturally affirmed, as Herbert Marcuse would say. I want to emphasize controlling the contexts in which that happens, because control of context is control of reality. Context is everything. Everything is context. And the broadcast is the meta-context for everything. Now, here comes the important point. It has the power to define, for most people, most of the time, in any politically relevant sense, the four basic dimensions of reality. Existence, priorities, values, and relations. Existence, what's real and what's not. Priorities, what's important and what's not. Values, what's good or bad, right or wrong, and how they're related. I say a lot of people, a lot of speakers are sort of dancing around that idea. We, questions have been asked here. Of course, you know, it's the old, uh, uh, if you're a hammer, everything's a nail, and that's how I see these things, but it's up to you to decide if, if your uh, desires fit into this. Who gets to define those things at politically relevant scale? Who's excluded from conversations that establish understandings and agreements at that scale? Because there's no power greater than that. The power to control the social construction of reality, that is to say, the conditions of meaning, is the ultimate power. Like all cultures, the broadcast is a technology of the self. I take that from uh, Michel Foucault and twist it a little bit. Um, every culture is a technology of the self. Right? It's, it's in which we construct ourselves, and in this case, in the broadcast image. Everything we think, feel, desire, and do, or don't do, results from our living in it. We are who we are, and therefore civilization is what it is, because we internalize those understandings and agreements. We become the place we live in. We're not born in the world, the world is born in us. So that's generally what I mean by the broadcast. In the, uh, in the text, it goes on for many pages, and um, I think you should read it. <laughs> uh, so that's a broadcast. Next is this breathtaking hinge of history that I mentioned at the beginning, that for 40 years I have called the global eco-social crisis. Four world historic events converge right now for us. This is our time. Breathtaking. And again, uh, internet, as soon as I get home, I'm going to change this and just say the digital condition with the understanding of the internet at the center of it. Now, take a look at that. What, what, is, what does that tell us? Well, one thing, it tells us that we, li we live right now in futures that have come to pass. Apocalypse and utopia. Apocalypse, not expected so soon, the ecological holocaust, and the rise of the digital condition, which I call utopia, and we'll expand on that more. Now, look at that. Any single one of these by itself would throw civilization into crisis. And uh, you might say, well, why, why the internet? Well, get into that. Together, they constitute a challenge, the challenge to create on the same scale as we can destroy, that, well, first of all, we can't imagine it really, and I'm trying to help us imagine that, but it may well be insurmountable, but it doesn't help to dwell on that. So what? I want to go to another Bucky quote here before we get into looking at each one of these pieces. Whether we're able to be a complete success or failure is in such critical balance 
that every smallest human test of integrity, every smallest moment-to-moment -moment decision tips the scales affirmatively or negatively. Isn't that not one aspect of where we are today? Don't we know this? Isn't it, I mean, we're, this is a critical hinge of history. This is very serious business. And I know that we would love to make that our way of being in the world. <laughs> and I'm trying to suggest one avenue, one thing that might lead to that. But let's, let's define, go on and define some of these things. First one, ecological holocaust. Now, I, I know that what I'm going to say here, you all know this, but I, it, I feel like it's necessary. And I, for 40 years, I've used this term, eco-social system. It seemed to me so obvious. Natural ecologies and human ecologies are both ecologies. You can't separate them, and so you have an eco-social system. The integration of human and natural ecologies on a planetary scale. Biosphere and civilization constitute a single structure. That's hardly a new idea. This is from the text. Except now we're forced to take it seriously, hmm? make it our way of being in the world. And that coupling, the natural environment becomes a built environment. And in the case of GMOs, for example, organisms become ideological structures. It's the ultimate expression of what Jürgen Habermas called capitalist colonization of the life world. So, this litany, you know, you've heard a billion times, planetary heating. Notice I don't say global warming. Planetary heating has a little more bite, I think. The water, food, and energy crises, mass extinctions, ocean dead zones, Arctic meltdown, overpopulation, mega urbanization, and the pollution, and I might say disease, uh, that it generates of everything, on and on. All racing in slow motion toward what Bruce Dahmer calls the great crescendo. The time wave is gathering momentum, and so is the chaos that rides it. Not only peak oil, but peak peace. Civilization grows meaner by the day, and it's only beginning. And this is the world in which we're going to create on the same scale that we can destroy. <clears throat> OK, so those are my comments on that part of the thing. Now, um, ah. I can't go back. <laughs> take, take those two together. C capitalist globalization and the end of democracy, okay? I want, I want to explain that and, and, and do that this way. Make an important distinction, and this is, I think, crucial, between globalization and capitalist globalism. Globalization is a world economy in which capital accumulation proceeds gradually throughout the world. A man named Emanuel Wallerstein is the father of globalization theory in that sense. In other words, the world is what, what commerce is. The world is the scale of commerce at any given historical moment. The world. That doesn't mean the globe. Right? So it proceeds historically, and uh, it's a historical process. It's existed in the West at least since the 16th century. In other words, it's not, this is not a bad thing. It's inevitable. How could this not happen, right? However, Capitalist globalism, a global economy, is something different. It's an economy with the capacity to work as a unit. Okay, I'm going to say an economy with the capacity to work as a unit in real time on a planetary scale. To say that that's a historically new reality is a massive understatement. That's breathtaking. And that's the world we live in. And one of the things it means, and I would say as a unit, globally in real time, one of the things it means is if there is a collapse, the world system collapses as a whole, because it is now a whole unit. There will be no second chance. It's collapsed. That's, now, that's one of, the thing, one of the challenges we're talking about when we talk about imagining at scale, creating at scale. We have to meet that. That's the scale and velocity that we have to imagine working at. And, you know, it's, it's obviously the, it's the end of democracy. You know, Neo neoliberal capitalism has laminated the planet. It's, it's the exact opposite of anything you could even remotely call democracy. And we see this happening all over the world, democracy collapsing everywhere and, and uh, you know, becoming uh, oligarchies and so on. <clears throat> okay. 
from the text. Here we are now, the internet, uh, digital condition. Why is that in there? What, what do we have to say about that? Consider the breathtaking historical coincidence of, on the one hand, the failure of democracy around the world, even as the ecological holocaust races in slow motion toward its tipping points, and on the other hand, the simultaneous rise, as if on demand, of the one thing that might enable a worldwide effort to prevent crisis from becoming catastrophe, or at least catastrophe not greater than it's already guaranteed to be. If the internet didn't exist, we'd have to invent it to even begin to imagine what creating at scale might mean. So thank God it's here, huh? but there's a problem. The communication revolution can't be allowed to happen because it's a mortal threat to the institutions of civilization that precipitated the eco-social crisis in the first place. Now I want to say here, the, the, uh, I said the, the communication revolution can't be allowed to happen. A communication, I'm gonna go in this later in greater detail, a communication revolution is the decentralization and pluralization of the social construction of reality. Let me say that again. A communications revolution is the decentralization and pluralization of the social construction of reality. That can't be allowed because you can see instantaneously that's the end of the dominating system. The whole thing, as we already said, the broadcast, that's its power to control in an imperial way existence, priorities, values, and relations. There's an, you know, that's it. If you lose that, you're down, and that's exactly what is happening now. And it's why the NSA has no choice but surveillance. It's all they know. It's all they've got. <clears throat> the cultural institutions of civilization, the cultural institutes of civilization, I call the broadcast. And it follows that secession from the broadcast, leaving the culture without leaving the country, is the necessary first step toward creating on the same scale as we can destroy. If you ascribe these problems to this, the culture, and again, on one, uh, you know, on the national level, what, is, what do you mean by the culture? Well, it's obviously the only one we share in common, such that we, such I could say the word, and you know what I'm talking about: neoliberal culture, consumer culture, whatever the hell. I say it's it's our local, you know, the local franchise of civilization. Okay, you know, doing that, leaving it, then is the necessary first step to even begin to think creating at scale. And the breathtaking fact is that the internet, the digital condition, actually does enable secession at that scale, which is why its very existence throws civilization into crisis. So that's one, one way. It's the end of centralized mass media and the social control that depends on it. We'll talk about the social control. That's a big point. There was no exit, no outside before. Now there is. Now there are unlimited alternatives at global scale. We've been hearing ideas about that for the last few days. We're no longer held against our will. We're no longer trapped inside the signal, constrained by the code. The broadcast knowledge sanctions are lifted. We're released from cognitive lockdown. Although <laughs> you wouldn't know that by looking at people's behavior these days. Secession from dominant culture at the scale now possible means collapse of social control as we know it in liberal democracies. We want it to collapse because it drives the crisis, but that creates another crisis that compounds the apocalypse. The other crisis isn't a loss of social control. Quite the contrary, it's the metastasizing security and surveillance state, a lawless cyber panopticon with terrifying powers of totalitarian control. That's the second reason the internet throw civilization into crisis. <clears throat> now, again, I want to make this point. The, the NSA, understood as dominator society, whatever you call it, has no choice. Because if the internet enables either totalitarian control or utopian freedom, if they don't really push on maintaining totalitarian control over the thing, the people will do exactly the opposite. What will they do exactly the opposite? What I'm calling the build. They're going to start imagining at scale, self-consciously, self-referentially. And I'm going to make sure they do. That's my task in life. Um, 
Which is to say, going on in the text, that the cultural arm of social control in America, the cultural arm of control, there are other kinds, of course, is now based exclusively on a mass identification with the culture that's not enforceable. The very existence of this apparatus that enables millions to systematically disidentify with the American imaginary, to willfully estrange ourselves from the master signifier, America, that's a new menace to social control, and they are not going to ignore it. It's COINTELPRO forever. I want to, uh, now that's the text. I want to comment. I say, uh, the cultural arm of social control, and I say, the cultural arm of control, there are other kinds, of course. Well, yeah, economics, law, all that stuff we know. But the way I look at it, culture is behind all of those things. Culture, you might, in this frame, culture is desire. Well, somebody desires those economics, those laws, capitalism, and all of that, or they wouldn't be there, the domineers, and they create a world which, which allows it to be there. So desire, consciousness, the way we think the world, the way we think power is behind all of this stuff. So I say culture is all of it. And with the understanding of how you would, you know, nuance those things. <clears throat> And I, I, frankly, to me, it's jaw-dropping to realize what a house of cards the Imperium has become, how tenuous the base for social control is in America today, how unsound are its moorings, how precariously it rests on a gamble that the audience nation won't change its mind. Well, maybe we won't. But the, the point is the possibility is there on a scale that should terrify the dominators and exactly what they can do about it beyond the futile intimidation of surveillance is far from obvious. And it, it is futile. So we, the people of the audience nation, face a challenge for which nothing in past experience has prepared us. We've known that for decades. So one might reasonably ask, are we really the ones we've been waiting for? Do we, do we really possess the radical will that can come only from us? There's not much evidence of it. America is one of the most depoliticized nations in the industrial world. We live in the land of look-away. T.S. Eliot said the world ends not with a bang but a whimper. If only it would be so dramatic. And given the level of distraction in America, it's more likely the last instant of history will go by unnoticed. So it turns out, and not that, not that we didn't always know it, that the eco-social crisis is first and foremost a crisis of will and idea crisis of confidence and imagination, the expected result of our socialization in the broadcast. I mean, if you take seriously the, the, how powerful it is, what do you think? We're, we're all severely damaged. And that, you know, that's a good thing. We need to recognize that. You, you can't you know, deal with a disease be, if you haven't diagnosed it. I mean, severely damaged. Here we are you know, in total uh, planetary emergency, and basically, we can't imagine what to do about it. If that isn't damage, I don't know what is. <clears throat> so, which means that creating on the same scale as we can destroy begins with recreating ourselves, right? As imaginative beings. Re-socializing ourselves to become the kind of people who would be capable of mo mobilizing radical will on the scale that's needed. We need mass radicalization. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go into that in a moment. Mass radicalization. How do we imagine that? And how do we do that? How do we awaken the radical will that sleeps within us? The answer to this immemorial question is found in what I call the utopian myth of a communication revolution. That's what I was talking about at the beginning. Uh, but before I, uh, before I explain it, we need to get into this idea about utopian radical. Going back to Mr. Fuller and uh, going on to Oscar Wilde. Map of the world doesn't include utopia, it's not worth glancing at. It leaves out the one country at which humanity is always landing. Now, this is really important to me. If I'm going to use these words, there has, there has to be a reason. Both those words re refer to, in their separate ways, transformation at the root. 
That is, they're both radical from the Latin radix, root. So I'm saying to you, utopia is the desire for transformation at the root. Radical is acting upon that desire, actively trying to transform the root. Think about those classic kind of you know, fanciful utopias of, uh, of Moore, Hobbes, and Locke, these perfect worlds, you know. But first of all, let me say, to, to think of utopia as some kind of perfect world, never, ever, ever do that. First of all, utopia is a desire. It's not a place. It's not a kind of world. It's simply a desire. No desire is ever naive. Only its expectations are naive. <clears throat> um, but, but think about them. The interesting thing, as Frederick Jameson points out, uh, <clears throat> is that they leap to the post-revolutionary utopian condition. Here we are in this utopian world. And by the way, when we say it's a desire for what? If you really look at it, think about it, utopian desire is the desire for a release from hierarchy. How could any world be desirable still retaining this, where there are dominators, where there is no equality, right? In other words, democracy. So utopia is the desire for democracy, right? So, but here we are in those worlds with no suggestion whatsoever of how we got there. We're just there. And what's left out is that axial moment, that break with history. What would have to have happened to get us there into that, <laughs> into that democratic world hardly perfect and that's the beauty of the, those old standard utopias we're forced to supply the break we're forced to imagine what would have to happen so we're gonna i'm gonna get back on that several times uh, in other words what would be the insurgent algorithm that got us there in the first place um, and so again to repeat that, utopia is the desire for democracy, this release from hierarchy, and radical is the acting on it to try to enable that, to bring it about. So I want to say, never, ever, ever use those words in a, in a negative, pejorative way. That's collaboration and our oppression at the very root. Never, ever. We've got to change. We've got to you know, recuperate those words and change the way we think those things. Because if you understand what we've been saying about the e eco-social crisis, you understand that every conceivable solution to the eco-social crisis is a utopian solution. Transformation at the root. Listen to the everyone in the world is calling for that. People would say, the system isn't working. What, what do you mean by system? That's the root. It, if it's systemic, you're talking about the root. You don't reform it. Uh, and so in that sense, you know, to trash utopia, I mean, how, how dare you do that? And then while you're talking on and on and on about democracy, the most utopian of all dreams. Right? It's just, that's one of the ways in which you're damaged. So they both mean the same thing. They're redundant in that sense. Never ever requ equate radical will e with extreme. Let me put this another way. If in fact the eco-social crisis is a systemic root crisis and therefore needs, to be, needs transformation at the root and that radicals are the ones who are going to attempt to do that, what does that mean? That means radicals are, are the heroes of our time for really, not, I'm not talking about radical, you understand, like commies or you know that stuff going for the root, whatever we say it may be. And I, you know, I, I think it's, it's capitalist globalism, the neoliberal uh, laminating of the planet. But th the point being that if you're not a radical today, you're, you're in the way, you know. You're, you're inhibiting something that we have to do. And what we have to do, it, you know, if we say, well, we need to become the kind of people who do this, we're saying mass radicalization. 
But notice how our heads, you know, there's that tug back to the way we're socialized. Oh, wow, mass radicalization, gee, that's bad shit. <laughs> Never, ever, ever do that. There is nothing, and I mean nothing, radical in what we are talking about here. Radicals work at oil companies. If you wake up in the morning to make your $100,000 a day, you're willing to alter the chemical composition of the atmosphere, then you're engaged in a more radical act than anyone who ever came before you. I want to um, go to this beautiful quote from Hannah Arendt, one of my heroes. So we're talking about creating a scale, imagining it at scale. Hannah Arendt says that in order to do that, we need a certain kind of freedom. The capacity to call something into being, which did not exist before, which was not given, not even as an object of cognition or imagination, and which therefore, strictly speaking, could not be known. Isn't that what, that's the same thing we mean when we say crisis of imagination. And it's the same thing which, which the dominators cannot ever permit to happen. Bring that new thing, bringing that new thing that could not be known into knowingness, is, it's the end of them. And they're going to fight that to the death. <clears throat> so I said that this is going to lead us to the utopian myth of a communication revolution. And you know what I mean by that. You heard the, uh, the call for the national, quote, information utility. What I'm about to show you, the next couple of slides, I lifted from this article I wrote in a Coevolution uh, Quarterly, 1977. And uh, yeah, what I mentioned earlier about desire, the control of desire. So in there, I lifted just for this talk. All those years ago, these two uh, contrasts. So I say that on a technical level, a communication revolution, purely on a technical level, it's not the one that matters, is you, these two things, centralized, decentralized. These are old, and we all have seen this a billion times. Point one, it has been done. This is the reality today. There's no doubt about that. It would reflect a paradigm shift in our heads as, as, as an audience nation. This, this kind of shift, right? Dominator to partnership, hierarchy to heterarchy, heteronomy, that is other law to autonomy, self-law, communication versus conversation, and from control to coherence. Coherence is the result of conversation. I want to point out uh, you know, we're calling for this national information utility. In other words, th th that um, the technical model is only the possibility of a, of a communication revolution. What it needs is policy. What's missing from that is the policy that would think it, organize it, and legalize it according to these values. In other words, the nation, the government, or whoever, would have to actually say, oh, this is really cool, let's do that. Right. The state would have to explicitly endorse and embrace these principles and write them into law. But this is not the revolution. But secession from the broadcast is still possible. Right? We're, we're in what I call the paleo-cybernetic phase of all this. So let's get into it. I want to introduce you to uh, some other heroes of mine. And not only heroes, but actual mentors that I worked with and who influenced my life greatly uh, beyond Bucky. So Bucky certainly did. He was a hinge of history for me. But there were others, Humberto Maturana and Heinz von Forster, Together, in a certain complex way, the founders, if you will, of what is now called second order systems theory, the cybernetics of cybernetics. And uh, along with them, this is uh, back in uh, 1977, Francisco Varela, 
died some, quite some years ago, who was actually the one in my conversations with him uh, brought about what we're just going to talk about. And also one that's not in here, Gordon Pask, uh, hailed in the, in the cybernetic world as one of the great theorists and his thing of conversation theory. I highly recommend you reading these, uh, reading this stuff, this field, it's uh, very powerful. Radical autonomies is what I took away from it. Way back, since that article, 77 is at least the idea of autonomous reality communities. And what, that is really, what that really is about, that's the foundation for decentralizing and pluralizing the social construction of reality. From my conversations with those guys, and, and uh, Cisco in particular, I came to understand the importance of conversations from the Latin conversari to turn around together. It's generative, right? Conversation is generative. It brings forth worlds. It's how we construct realities, existence, priorities, foundations, all that stuff. We can talk about things because we generate the things we talk about by talking about them. That's a closure, right? That's autonomy. We become a reality community, right? You talk the things, uh, uh, the Latin res, R-E-S, basis of the word reality. And the closure, the circularity of that cultural autonomy, right? Turning around together seals our cultural autonomy. We become an autonomous reality community. Now, that's what we usually mean by virtual community, right? But Virtual is irrelevant, so what? How you do it? It's not irrelevant, it's about scale. That virtuality enables it to go to scale. I say reality community because they're virtual, not physical, because they're atopias without topology, defined not by physical space, but mental space, not by geography, but by consciousness, ideology, and desire. And like all communities, a reality community exists as long as the conversations that constitute it exist and no longer. Now that phrase is actually redundant because there's no other kind of community. Every community is an autonomous reality community that brings forth the things it talks about by talking about them. In other words, every community is a conspiratorial conversation that generates the realities that define it as a community conspire to breathe together, to turn around together, we breathe together to turn around together, right? Now, I realize all this is kind of an abstract level, but I, I hope you see yourself in it. I'm going back to this, this model and going back to my, my work as, as a model builder, a utopian builder of models. What I mean by the build. That article was titled, Secession from the Broadcast. That's about leaving something, right? But when you leave one thing, you move toward another. And that other, where you move toward, that's important, you know. To, to really leave the broadcast, you have not left the broadcast if you're not moving towards something that is its opposite, right? So I found language I like a lot from the uh, sociologist, Hugh Searle, life world, home world, and alien world. Life world is the, the world that you, as an individual right now, subjectively inhabit and experience as a lived experience at any instant, right? So right now, we're all, this is our life world, this auditorium and all that. If one of you was to walk out in the foyer there, your life world would change, would be different from ours in that little tiny sense, right? So life world is just, it's a simple idea. It's what you subjectively experience at any instant right now. That's your life world. You know that there's, these, there's one out there called the world and all that, but, okay? I, uh, have all my life, been interested in the idea of a media life world. What is your media life world? Before the internet, it was, you know, the networks, right? It was the broadcast, the, the dominators, the perceptual imperialists. That was the media life world. Uh, then, you know, it started getting more and more um, diverse. There were more, quote, channels, right? But those channels all said the same thing. And so in a way, they weren't. But what happened was, you know, cable, all that stuff I in that early lecture, 70 floor, putting all that cable and all that stuff together. Suddenly we had 500 channels. But, you know, they were all the same. But you could assemble from that media life world 
your own personal media homeworld. Now, Hugh Searle didn't really mean that. <laughs> he was talking about children, actually, but he was talking about a child's life world. But I love that word. I think it's potent. Now, think to yourself what we actually do today from that huge media life world out there we call the cloud or the commons, right? Each of us is actively engaged in building our personal media home worlds. That, this is not, again, not techno babble. That is actually what we're doing. Once you think that, you see that. That is what we're doing. And the, the threat of the digital condition to the dominators is that that opens up <laughs> the ability to, first of all, seed the commons with materials which we then, as individuals, download from the commons and build media homeworlds whose, whose elements, you know, whose, whose content is exactly counter to the imperatives of social control. This is why they're hysterical. I don't think they could say it to themselves that way, but that, that's it. Hugh Searle also had alien world. Um, he didn't mean that negatively. All he meant by that was the other. I like it <laughs> for the connotation that we would put on it. And uh, <clears throat> let me, a um, li little more about this life world, home world. Alan Kay, some of you may know who he was, a true, true visionary uh, of computers. computers. <laughs> Apple wouldn't exist without him. Uh, and he, he said, a computer is a meta-medium, a tool for building tools, right? Meta-medium. That, that's what coding is, right? The media life world is also a meta-medium, a social meta-medium, a tool for building technologies of the self. Think of it that way, how to use it consciously that way. So we go, so the build using the life world to build our home worlds that are radical. The only thing you can control and you must therefore control is the imagery in your own mind. The problem is imagining how to do that on scale and having the resources to do it, which we now do. The build, step one, leave the culture. Leave. That means you got to go somewhere else. And what we're doing these days is building that somewhere else. We don't realize it, people don't talk about it that way, but they're starting to. I, I, I monitor the so-called alternative media constantly every day for that language to see, are people kind of edging towards this? And they are, believe me, they are, but it's unconscious, right? <clears throat> or some might argue that it's pretty conscious. Stop knowing the broadcast. What, what, that, that word knowing is really important. Okay, so we, we see things, right? Uh, television, let's say television movies. We read text, so all the, the, wor the text world. We hear things, everything that's audible. But all of them are vehicles, you may say, to knowing, it's how we know. So I've, I've started, I think this word knowing is really important. Uh, so for example, if you took that seriously, and you know, so there might be a conversation like this. Hey, you know, I was uh, knowing CNN last night, and this guy said, or you could say it this way, you know, I was thinking CNN last night, and this woman said, now, let's get back to that utopian. There we are at that, imagine a world in which all of us were saying that. Imagine that, everybody in here. You never said I was watching, or I was reading, or I was listening. You said, you know, I was knowing, I was thinking, that is a revolutionary mind. You'd be way up in a meta domain looking down on the whole thing, like sociologists do. That's why they're radical by definition. What would get us there? Let's not leap over that axial moment. That's what the build is about. What would have to happen to bring about a world in which everyone said, the broadcast, and we know what we're talking about. That I was knowing and thinking these things rather than using the senses, and everybody understood that. The world would be revolutionized, you know it, to get to that point. <clears throat> I'm suggesting that the build, what I call the build, building your, your home worlds to enforce it, building the home worlds uh, that you practice, 
transformation of the self in that way. We'll get more, more, more to that. You know that quote from Ep Epictetus, the only thing you can control and must therefore control is the imagery in your own mind. This, this addresses that directly. Is it okay? How are we going to do that? And how are we going to do it at scale? Step one. Now I'm talking, hey, this isn't theory, by the way. This is my lived experience. It's brought me to be able to talk about this. But, but I just want to say that leaving the broadcast, leaving the culture is hardly a new idea these days. And you can find it across the spectrum from this uh, sort of spiritual writer, Thomas More, Care of the Self, becoming renegades and planting seeds for a new one. Is that not building a better model of a culture? And then we have our friend Malcolm X. So as I say, this is, the need for this is recognized everywhere by the entire spectrum of humanity. Uh, this is a current little language I'm playing with. I like this personally. <laughs> what we're doing now, although we're not saying it and we're kind of semi-conscious of it, we are assembling for Exodus because as the, the, the commons grows and gets more self-aware, as we get more self-aware about drawing down from the commons and building our own radical media home worlds that are exactly counter to the imperatives of social control, that's going to become more and more obvious to, it, to us, to people. And I'm trying to accelerate that. This is my work. I'm trying to say, excuse me, look what we're doing. If we only do this consciously, shoom, you know, you accelerate a lot. I talked about mass radicalization, right? To become the kind of people who, who are capable and willing of doing that thing which we so desperately need to do, have the will have the, have the vision, which is the utopian vision, the desire, and have the action, which is the radical action, radical transformation. So number one, there are these six steps that I, I kind of realized what I was doing. <clears throat> Here they are. Now, I, this is a report. This is not theory. I'm telling you what I went through. I looked back and I said, okay, if I'm going to try to help people understand this and you know, point to a certain avenue, what happened to me? And here's what I realized over a period. Now, this is, this is a period of many, many years to, to be able to realize this. First of all, when you, when you, when you leave the culture, you've got your media home world, you're using it as a, as a technology of the self to transform yourself into a, a utopian radical. First thing you've got to do is break your heart repeatedly. Never stop breaking your heart. I think I don't have to go into that. If you look at the so-called uh, alternative media, you see heartbreaking stuff all, I mean, it's nonstop. If you're looking for it, if it's there, and part of the build is to make that really intense, you know, to, to curate and understand what are things that would break your heart. And I, I've been moved to tears by some of the things I've known in this way. So I don't think that needs to be, you know it's heartbreaking. Cultivate feelings of impotence and, <laughs> and futility, okay? This is really important. Someone asked me, why the hell would you want to do that? Isn't that debilitating? Okay, here, here it is. What does this mean? What we are seeing in this, in this conference, the, the, the edge of, of, the, of, of our art and technology, which, by the way, we all know is the most potent alliance you could possibly imagine these days, Amazing, heartening, inspiring, incredible thing. What you, what you realize immediately is that we know how to do this. We can do this. We can create at scale. We gotta start fast. But you, 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 you know, you see the solution. You say, "My God, the broadcast's keeping this from me." All you know, and that's where the impotence and futility comes. So. I'm saying part of the build, building your media home world, is not just that negative thing where you, you, know, you critique the broadcast and you know, all that sort of thing. Yes, that's incredibly important. In other words, reasons to leave it are incredibly important. But the place we're going to, we build the place. It's like lay down a path and walking, you know? The build is that. So <clears throat> that's where all this beautiful potential is. 
call it utopian. Hell yes, it is. It's about transformation at the root. Every one of the presentations I've seen here is about that. And so, and, and, and you know, I'm talking about feature films, documentaries, whatever. I don't care what it is, get those out there, become aware that we are at this breathtaking hinge of history. The hinge swings both ways, you know, it's open. And all that gorgeous stuff that you all do is standing there. It's closed because the dominators just cannot, if we start doing that, it's their end. They can't allow this to happen. They'll go down in flames. Well, great, let's light the match. That impotence and futility, you're pissed. You know, I really got that point. God damn it, I didn't, you know, this is amazing. I, I, why don't we hear this? I, in, in conferences like this, we do hear it. I mean, I have the feeling I just want to drop to my knees on a public sidewalk and thank God that this, the richest, the, the majesty of the human imagination is before us now. It's there if you are looking for it. If you have the eyes to see it, it's there. And it's just incredibly moving. It's, it's beautiful. You see the lie about ourselves that we're forced to live in, you know, that we can't do this. Okay, so you're building your... Uh, home world, and uh, the, the next step then is you got to confront your fear because we're, we're all in the, in the crosshairs of the panopticon, right? I mean, they're, it's COINTELPRO forever. They, they know you're doing this. I actually came and, you know, I have some visibility, you know, a little, little audience that listens to me now and then, and <clears throat> I thought, shit, you know, I, I think I'm onto something really potent here. Am I going to go on with this? You know, because I see every day uh, what they do to people, you know. Am I, uh, I'm too old to be tortured, and you know, I just don't want to do that. And I really got frightened. I thought, my whole life's work has led me to this point, and I'm going to chicken out. I called up my friend Barsamian because he's, he's out there, you know, he's visible. I said, David, you know, I'm really afraid, and you, like you, you got, you got some... Uh, some advice, and he, all he said was, it's your choice. What else could he say? Well, I tell you, I, I lived with that, that image. And you know what happens? It goes away. You live with it, familiarize yourself with it, and it goes away, and your fear goes away. But I guarantee you, well, maybe you won't reach that phase, but I did. The next thing is... Uh, Hope, free yourself from hope. There are many, many quotes like, hope is the rope from which we all hang. Margaret Atwood, uh, as a species, we're doomed by hope. Or Friedrich Nietzsche in his story about uh, Pandora's box, hope is the greatest of all evils as it prolongs the torment of man. You know, the last thing left in Pandora's box was hope, right? And we, I, we need to leave it there. Hope springs eternal and has to be killed every time it shows up. Now, hope and radical are mutually exclusive in that sense. You understand? And here, I think for me, uh, uh, you know, they're mutually exclusive because to live in hope is to live in the future. That's not radical. You're not going to transform anything if you're thinking about that. And for me, I was really struck by the way Derek Jensen uh, talks about it. Hope is a longing for a future condition over which you have no agency. A longing for a future, you know, it's abdicating agency. It means you're essentially powerless. Something, and he says, something wonderful happens when you give up on hope. You realize you never needed it in the first place. So, you know, I say freeing yourself from hope doesn't mean that you can't have hope. It just means that you're going to do what you're going to do regardless, you know, so there's no hope, so what? I'm, I'm a radical utopian and I'm doing this, you know. The world, <laughs> there's no choice. I mean, you know, it's like, great. So why bother with hope? <clears throat> and then turn the outrage into the rage of radical will and I say channel it into the build. That's what you should do with your radical will, do the build. So. You can imagine building these media worlds, you're gonna make feature films, you're gonna make big documentaries. And by the way, those, you know, this revolution of the documentary that we're living in, I mean, that is breathtaking. I, I, 
I have hundreds of these things. I copy them every time they're on, and I, re I watch them repeatedly over and over and over. That's what you do in the broadcast, right? Over and over, you're getting the same shit all the time, with little tweaks in it. For, first of all, these documentaries need repeated viewing. They're dense, and they're, they're our, in our time, they're long, that's long-form journalism. You know, the journalist freaked out some years ago. Oh, my God, it's all over. Bullshit. These, these documentaries, and I'm sure you know many very, very powerful ones, they are long-form journalism, and they're a hell of a lot more fun than reading the New York Times. So, so I want to focus on, we know we can make those long things. I want to focus on interstitials. That's, what, that's the space between programs, or it's the program break, the interstitial. What are you going to see in the broadcast? Capitalism. Consume, consume, consume. That's a, and think about how powerful that is. Context is everything. The control of context. And, and <clears throat> filling every crack around the programs with commercial, with capitalism, is, is a powerful context. It changes what's in that program. You could have a program as radical as hell. If all around it are commercials, it's drained of its potency. Control of context is everything. So I, I want to focus in on interstitials. <clears throat> and the, we just talked about capitalism. So here's just a, two or three examples of what I mean, and things that I see. The way that capitalist competition operates is if you don't act sociopathically, you will go under. Once you get a system in place that starts creating sociopaths, then they will create additional rationalizations for the sociopathological behavior. Capitalism, the system we have, is a disaster. Everything that has happened is the result of an economic system that doesn't work for the mass of the people. You gotta get this. Capitalism isn't there in, this, in my media homeworld. I have not seen a television commercial in its own context for decades. The only time I see them now is when they're recontextualized over into the documentaries or Amy Goodman, all these things. And when you move something from one context to another, it becomes something different, you know? A thing is where it is. That's number one. But these, these things, just think about it for a while. The masses of people out there who are seeing these commercials and in my home world, this is, this is the exact opposite of the imperatives of social control. This is what I see all the time. I've just picked three. I could, and what I want to do, and you can help me with a bill, is just, <laughs> I want to have 50 of these examples to show in, in, in the next lecture. Okay, take another one, the eco-social crisis. The fossil fuel industry is killing us. They have five times the amount of coal, gas, and oil that is safe to burn, and they want us to burn it all. Many climate science experts worry that if left to their own devices, the fossil fuel extractors will push us past the brink of cataclysmic disaster. Over and over, I want to hear that. I want that to be my mantra. I want to get up in the morning and say to myself, I'm going to sit in front of that screen like a, like a meditation sitting and work on myself with my media home world as a, as, as a radicalizing technology as a, of the self, I want to hear that a billion times. Life as we know it will be altered forever. Can you imagine the broadcast saying this? If they carry out their business plan, the planet tanks. If the commons are privatized, if they're handed over to ExxonMobil and uh, you know, Chevron and so on, we're dead. Okay, here's another one I want to see every day, all the time. I am a revolutionary. we're really talking about is radical evolution. I, I decided, <laughs> put this together and then decided, you know, I'm not going to use that word revolution ever again. I'm a radical evolutionary. What we're really talking about is radical evolution. Mutation at the root. Mutation at the root. Which is transformation. Not revolution, which is a circle that ends up where it began. 
here comes the new boss, and it is the old boss. And anyway, you know the word revolution is stone dead when it's a campaign slogan to be the imperial president. Everyone in this room would agree America is an empire. So to behave accordingly is to think imperial president, especially since the problem is not imperialism, but imperialists. There would be no empire without imperialists who create them and run them. American empire has been consciously and deliberately driven as empire by every president since Teddy Roosevelt, who, when asked how America got the Panama Canal, responded, we took it. So never say president. Always say imperial president, that you're talking truth, just as we always should say state media. All right? All right. In my media home world, I want to valorize, heroicize the whistleblower. In other words, we're talking about everything that's, that's the exact counter opposite of the imperatives of social control. So we build home worlds and life worlds that, that attract the whistleblower. When the bill gets to a certain scale, it's going to do that like you would. It's certain that it's going to do that because, because notice what is already happening. But I want it to be like this. There's a, it's official. It's ritualized. It's heroicized. Yes. I see that. You see, I mean, that, what I see there is that guy, you know, they're pointing. I see that he's got this huge whistle, right? This whistle that like fills the cosmos. Boom, you know, whistleblowers. Shove it in their face. We're not taking it seriously if we don't. There will be no build if you don't do that. And you're not shoving it in their face. You're shoving it in your face. You're building your home world. That's happening in your house and nowhere else, except everybody else. A billion other houses are building their radical home worlds. And you put things like, like this out there, Courage is contagious, as Edward Snowden said. Citizen tribunals is something I want to see all the time. I want to pull down citizen tribunals where all these CEOs, all these, I have to control my language, who don't get punished for the obscene crimes they do. And I, I want to see them put on trial, and I want to see it every day, every day, every day. And it would be something like this. Sorry, these, these clips just, I'm an amateur. Jane did that. Thank you, Jane. Okay. Uh, heroes of the build, I'm going to pass this by. And go to this. Talked about meta design, the computer as meta medium, and the social meta medium uh, in which we construct ourselves. Uh, the, the medium uh, which gives us our technologies of the self, right? Drawing them down from the, from the commons. Okay, Nam June was amazing. This is 1965. And see what that says? He's, he's lifting it up, right? He's elevating it from the individual artwork to the meta level, the level of meta design. Art for cybernated life, which I call secession from the broadcast. And then you get to this other very famous one. Art's not a mere help to reality, a hammer with which to shape it. If there ever was a time in which art is in a position to do that at scale, it's now. This is a heroic time for us that we just grasp it, understand it, and move toward it. Let me just make a, a couple of points about that idea, right? Uh, 
I'll, I'll just read here. The separation of art and culture from the social inaugurates culture as a realm in its own right and defines it as such. The very distance of culture from its social context that allows it to function as a critique and indictment of the latter also dooms its interventions to ineffectuality and relegates art and culture to a frivolous, trivialized space in which such intersections are neutralized in advance. That's a quote from Frederick Jameson. He said it better than I could. A lot of people I heard today are, are after that, are, are coming at that idea, right? That's a problem. How can you, doesn't art lose its potency if, if, if it becomes instrumental? No, not if you're building an alternative world. Not if you're building to leave. Uh, and, but however, that separation uh, represents the failure of what Jürgen Habermas called the project of modernity, which he saw as the struggle to integrate cultural and social modernization so that culture would guide and inform systems. There is no progress under those conditions. Uh, and that has been implicit in the great cultural and political movements of the 20th century in culture, the historical avant-garde, right? And in the social sphere, the politics of liberation, the theorist Peter Berger in his book Theory of the Avant-Garde argues that the project of the historical avant-garde uh, in the 20s uh, was to destroy the social institution of autonomous art and merge art with life. Art was not to be integrated into the existing life praxis, rather a new life praxis was to arise from a basis in art. Cultural evolution was to guide and inform social evolution. Now, of course, they failed, those, those futurists and Dadaists. They, they revolutionized art, but not the world. How could they have? I'm suggesting that the build is about doing that. We can do that. And art becomes dangerous again. This is a rush. And so going to the text, far from being dead, the project of the historical art guard is more alive today than ever, but it has nothing to do with any particular style or aesthetic. It's possible only on an extra, extra aesthetic and supracultural level through the alliance of the traditional artist and the new artist as social meta designer, context provider, however you want to call it. In this alliance, the meta designer creates the possibility of social and cultural autonomy, radical autonomies, within which artists create content in contexts they control. Control of context is everything. Artists, after all, create the most powerful and poignant representations of being in the world, the most compelling visions of possible world to be in. In the new alliance, art is empowered and revitalized in a way it never could be without the control of context made possible by the social meta designer. As much as it brings together art and technology, the alliance of artists and social meta designer also merges art and politics. Together, they constitute a new social, cultural, and political force as a humanistic rather than merely artistic movement toward creating its scale. What's avant-garde is the alliance as such, that pure social relation, regardless of its as, uh, ethics or aesthetics. One can view the situation aesthetically, of course, but that doesn't determine its avant-gardeness, its avant-garde status. What makes the alliance avant-garde is the integration of art and life it makes possible, building your media homeworld. This means that any kind of art, no matter how stylistically or aesthetically retrograde it may be, can participate in an avant-garde phenomenon because the work of art is no longer the site of avant-gardeness. It's about group expression, not self-expression. Okay, remember I said we were going to return to that socialized, toll-free content separate from conduit. And now this is where we do it. This phrase, we must create on the same scale as we can destroy, was coined by a woman named Sherry Rabinowitz in 1979. She and her husband, Kit Galloway, changed my life as much as Bucky and Hines and all those people. When I heard that phrase, we must create on the same scale as we can destroy, I said, shit, in one sentence, she encapsulated everything I've ever wanted to do. It's what world game is about. It's what creating a scale is about. And there it was. There they are. I shared a house with them for four years. We are as close together as you can get. She unfortunately passed away some years ago. I miss her. She was a some kind of woman. Jane actually added this. That's the fact, right? 
we don't even know how. That's what Hannah Arendt was saying, something that could not be known, we can't imagine. First, we have to learn to create on the same scale as we play. That's part of the build, cultivating that. And I would say we even have to learn how to learn it. It's so huge, right? All right, I use that term, emotional bandwidth. And, and this is the title of the book I'm doing on them. This is the title. The Telepresent World of Kit Galloway and Sherry, a Visionary Legacy for the Internet. You can see what we're doing tonight is like thinking the past in order to think the present, the future. Fall back to leap, as they say. These are their projects. You may have heard of them, some of them. Uh, Hole in Space is the most, uh, the best known. I want to talk about, right now coming up, Electronic Cafe International. But for those who have heard some of them, this, this is their whole life project that they went through. It's stunning. The vision here is amazing. Uh, right here at your Museum of Modern Art, some few years ago, you may, you may remember this exhibition, participation. Hole in Space was the cover. It's very well known, but it's not the most important. The Electronic Cafe is the most important. This is the idea of a, of, uh, you know, the most universal social space, the cafe, the local cafe. And what they did, uh, uh, here again, model builders. If, if there is wherever model builders, this is it, and I'm going to show you. <clears throat> you go into the space, and using current technology, all the ways in which people can come together in so-called virtual space, all the modalities of reading, writing, hearing, handwriting, everything you could possibly do, in a cafe situation, this has nothing to do with internet cafes. Get that out of your mind, and you will soon you will see that. And we'll just understand what that means as we go on here. So from uh, 1990 to 2000, uh, they did this experiment, Electronic Cafe and International, in which these two people built an international network of what they called electronic cafes Cafes in 62 countries were uh, were part of it at, at its peak. And so this was at the 18th Street Arts Complex in Santa Monica. <clears throat> it's a place dear to my heart. So much nostalgia is involved here. Uh, and it's, uh, it went from 3,000 square feet to 6,000 square feet and then back to three. Uh, one of the things they did was have printouts on the walls of the, of the um, connections, the two-way video connections. I think that was really smart. To, so you could, you know, it just doesn't like vanish, you know, vapor where you look at it and say, oh, that's, that's what we did. <clears throat> and it was a... Beauty. It was such a lovely space, such a comforting space to be in, and that's very that's part of it. That's a big part of it. <clears throat> the um, the vibe, if you will, <clears throat> and uh, so they, in those days, they had the telephone system was the only way you could do affordable uh, two way video. So they had to do slow scan, right? And we'll see these. So that that means that you get you get one video frame every six seconds. They were modeling, the builder of models. You, you work with what you've got, you know, and that's what they had. Sure, they could have, you know, tried to raise millions of dollars and do, do fiber optics, but that wasn't real. That wasn't, that's, that's, that's what corporations do. <clears throat> and so uh, you'll see. So I'm going to show you first, they used art. They said, you know, if this space, if, if, if conversational video conferencing space, if you will, can accommodate art, it can accommodate anything because art pushes everything in every direction. So they focused on the arts as you might say, the acculturating uh, vehicle for this space. <clears throat> Always making sure that there was a, a histogram, right, on the walls. And I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about the ritualization here. This, the ritualization is incredibly important to us today, and we'll say why. Okay, so here we're going to get into three or four of the modalities that they did. The first thing you're going to see here, they, okay, the, the abstract idea of people occupying the image as a place, right? The image as place. 
how can people around the world occupy the same images place? So just think of the, the technology today with which we would do that. They only could do it with superimposing uh, the two locations into one image place. People on the screen are all deaf. The girl in the white dress is here in Santa Monica. Everyone else is in Paris. They're just finishing an evening of deaf poetry and are relaxing and having cafe conversation. Uh, here's a sample of um, telecollaborative music. <clears throat> the two percussionists uh, up front are here in Santa Monica at the Electronic Cafe International. And the three uh, other performers are at the Electronic Cafe in Copenhagen. Okay, they pioneered the use of MIDI in telecommunication space. Mort Sabotnik. Across the stage. As the hand moves in this direction, we get low notes. And as it goes this way, we get high notes. The next one does patterns. This is 1991. because I want all five fingers to be playing. I'm going to do it with the elbow. So as the arm moves like this, it goes up the keyboard. The arm moves like this, it goes down the keyboard. You understand this is the first time most people even saw this possibility. Dana Vasulka is in Santa Fe. Mort is at the cafe in Santa Monica. They've got a laser disc of her early classic um, uh, video called Violin Power back in 1971 in the analog days where she was using the violin as the control to control analog pr processing of that video so you'd get all the warps on it. So that was like 71. Now it's 20 some years later. From Santa Fe, she's using her violin to control the playback of that laser disc in which she is using a violin to control analog processing. So it's this dual layer. So that's, that's this, the original violin power, 71. That's the slow scan video uh, coming in from Santa Fe. The people in the cafe are seeing her that way, controlling what they're seeing in the cafe. choosing them uh, as she went with the score. This is 1991, okay. Now, MIDI controls now, MIDI controlling music. And they're 
we're doing a piano duo between Terry Riley in Nice, France, and um, David Rosenboom. So this is a slow scan coming down every six seconds, a new frame. That's Terry Riley. And he's playing the disc clavier remotely, so it's a piano duo. I'm sure this stuff happens. I, I stopped researching this. I'm sure it happens all the time these days in a much more sophisticated way. But understand, they're modeling this with what they had available to them. This hadn't been done before. All, everything you're seeing here never had been done in telecommunication space. Ninety-one before any most people never heard of the internet. Dance uh, again using the composite image space, uh, co-occupy co a space. It's called the MIDI dancer suit, and I have eight sensors on my body. I'll show you the one here on my left elbow that will produce the the words that you'll be hearing in this piece. I. This was the only way they knew how to model such a space. And so they adapted their aesthetics to it. Being inside another person's body was the thing that they could do. So everything was built around that. This was uh, 1992. I can see you. I can see you. I can see you. Just by looking at your eyes, I'm beginning to get a feel for your brain, and I'm beginning to get a sense. OK. Barry says I have to stop, and I'm going to stop. Uh, so, so let me just summarize this. You would have seen, we would have gone from this to more political kinds of things, for example, exchange with Omar Cabezas, uh, the Sandinista leader, and a lot of powerful stuff that you, I was about to show you. The point I'm trying to, no, I mean, hey, I, I, I know I'm going on too long, so I'm, I'm not complaining at all. I appreciate your, your, your attention. Let me just, um, what I'm trying to suggest here, that this is what I call a social heterotopia, right? Heterotopia, hybrid space physical, virtual. It's also in the mind, you know? Uh, and I get that heterotopia again from Michel Foucault. I'm twisting it a little bit. I'm suggesting that the internet is incomplete without being grounded, without being anchored in these translocal community places which, like this, where, uh, my God, if, if there ever was a time, and what, what they said was, this is a this is an open laboratory for public acculturation of emerging technology. That's what they were doing. That stuff was emerging. Public acculturation. What is it good for? For us, not for the capitalists. If there ever was a time when we needed this, right? Uh, and so I'm suggesting that, you know, this thing about um, alone together, everybody, their face smashed into the iPhone. This... We gotta ritualize this. There, there has to be, these, these places have to be ritualized and where you're experiencing as groups, you are not jammed into the iPhone, you are together and you're together with another group on the other side and you're saying to yourselves, we are seceding, we are, this is our home, this is our public home world. And I'm saying, so the last thing I would have showed you, do it at the secession cafe. 
what if all together we're sitting here, you know, us and some place around the world, and we do the whistleblower madness, or the citizen tribunals, or heroes of the bill, whoever they may be. I, I would have made this point a little more powerfully than I am right now, but I hope you get the point. I'm suggesting that, that we need to do this. This is extremely important in mass radicalization. This is from Confucius. The way out is via the door. Why is it that no one will use this method? Thank you very much.